Christ had proven his great love for Judas moments before washing his feet. He's cared for Judas and has not, to this point, singled him out. Love covers a multitude of sin. His heart, though, is broken that Judas could know him and not love him. Truly, Christ is familiar with rejection and its bitter pain. We're in John chapter 13, and we're going to begin at verses 17 and 18. And uh, the title of today's message is Traitors in Our Midst. Now, I know the first thing you're going to do is look around and say, is he talking about me? Is he talking about me? Well, stick with me here. In our continuing study through the Gospel of John, we have learned that on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus met with his disciples for what he knew would be their final evening together before his passion on the cross. Nearing the conclusion of the meal, Jesus leaves his place. He takes the form of a servant and he washes each of his disciples' feet, including the feet of Judas, who would betray him, and Jesus knew it. If it were me, and I were to the point that I would actually humble myself enough to wash the people's feet. When I got to Judas, I'd say, well, not you, because I know you. But no, Jesus even washed the feet of Judas. You remember during this foot washing thing that Peter protested, but Christ insisted that he submit for cleansing if he intended to continue as a disciple. And there were four reasons for Christ's actions that we proposed last time. First of all, to physically demonstrate his great love for them. Secondly, to display his voluntary humility. Third, to illustrate a spiritual washing, as indicated to Peter, of the lowest part of man. And then fourth, to be an example of life and conduct to all those who would be his disciples down through the years, including you and me. And so now I'll, uh, I'll begin reading here, but actually I think I'm going to back up to verse 16 if you'll read along with me. And here's what we read in verse 16 of chapter 14. <clears throat> Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. I speak not of you all. I know whom I've chosen. But that the scripture may be fulfilled, he that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it come, that when it is come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit. And he testified and said, verily, verily, I say unto you, that one of you will betray me. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon the, the Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. He then, lying on Jesus' breast, said unto him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, and He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, He gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, that thou doest do quickly. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. For some of them thought because Judas had the bag that Jesus had said unto him, buy those things that we have need of against the feast or that he should go give something to the poor. He then having received the sop, 
went immediately out, and it was night. Oh, Father, we do thank you for your word. And, oh, Holy Spirit, I ask you now to lead us and guide us into all truth. Speak to our hearts, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Not everyone around that table was a traitor to Christ. Uh, Peter certainly failed a little later, didn't he? In fact, they all failed because the Bible says they all ran away. With many scandals that have rocked the church in the last few years, and you know them all, with the uncovering of so many false preachers and so many phonies, one might be tempted to question the loyalty of everybody. You can't trust anybody. You know, I think I've said that phrase to Carolyn this week probably 10 times. I can't trust anybody. I can't trust politicians. I can't trust doctors. <laughs> I was a school teacher. I can't trust school teachers. I can't trust preachers. Yeah, we can be tempted to look around and say, we're surrounded by fakes and phonies. But I want to assure you today of something that not all of Christ's followers are traitors. We may be weak, we may be fail, failing from time to time, but not all of Christ's followers betray him. Now, Jesus did indicate here that there was one in their number that is not right in his heart. There was a mixture of bad, even in good company, and that's something I think you have to keep in mind that there was even there was a Judas even among the apostles. And Jesus knew it and didn't root him out. Jesus himself knew who was right and who was not right. And Jesus himself knows who's right and who's not right today. I want you to notice this of Judas the betrayer, that he was admitted to the highest privileges with Christ. He ate his bread. Jesus fed him. Well, have you ever in your life been bitten by Someone you fed, you know, they say, don't bite the hand that feeds you. I guess in my life, I can tell you, I got bite marks all over my hands. <laughs> People. Here you think you're helping them out. And the next thing you know, chomp. Well, here's Judas eating his bread. In fact, Jesus is handing the sop to him. Now, I'm not much of a sopper. I don't know about you. Uh, I've, I've been to people's houses when they, they take their, I think their parents teach them this, I don't know. They take their, their bread that's left over at the end of dinner and they just kind of wipe their plate, you know, sop up all the gravy or anything that's there. To me, I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't want to do that. But here was Jesus handing the sop to Judas and Judas took it. He was guilty of the basest form of treachery. It was in his heart, even at that moment. He had forsaken Christ and he would forsake him again. You know, I think he despised the Lord in some way, which is hard to figure out. He had been in intimate fellowship with Christ. You can say, well, the problem is, is that people just don't know about Jesus. If they knew more about him, then certainly they would love him like we do. Well, one out of 12 didn't. One out of 12 knew who Jesus was, and yet he despised Christ, and he became his most bitter enemy. I don't understand that. I really don't. But here it is. 
And it is not a new thing for those who seem to be Christ's friends to turn their backs on him and to become his real enemies. That should not be something that we would consider strange. This is a mystery to me. How a person familiar with the loveliness of Christ could turn away. And to what does he turn to? Darkness and, and death. Now Christ exposed Judas's betrayal beforehand, you know. At least he exposed it to John. What was the reason for exposing the betrayal? Well, he wanted John and us to know that this was no surprise to him that Judas was a traitor. He knew about it all the time. His intention was to increase the disciples' faith after it occurred. After Judas betrayed him, uh, his disciples may have been tempted to say, well, Judas really fooled us and fooled Jesus too, you know. <laughs> he didn't fool Jesus. He shows us, Jesus does, that he knows, he has personal knowledge of the hearts of men and women. He knows our motives and our thoughts and, and why we do what we do. He also exposed Judas in advance to prove his position as Messiah of the Old Testament, who was prophesied to be betrayed by one of his own. Now, verse 20, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomever I send receiveth me, and he that receiveth me, if it receiveth me, receiveth him that sent me. These are words of encouragement. <clears throat> there were those who received Judas as a preacher, you know. You remember Christ had sent him out before times with the others. And they were ministered to people. So he was part of the ministry team. Perhaps there were those who were converted under Judas's ministry. How would you like that? Who led you to the Lord? Oh, Judas. Whoa. Perhaps there were those that were edified by his preaching. <clears throat> and yet afterwards he's proven to be a traitor. Yet he was one whom Christ had sent. Jesus sent him forth. Now, I may be talking to somebody today that you were led to Christ or you were influenced uh, toward Christ. You were taught by somebody that turned out to be a big phony. You know, that's not uncommon these days. Now, I don't want you to be shaken in your faith. The important thing is who did the sending? The important thing is Jesus. We can't know with certainty what men are or what they will be, but what we must receive those things and those people who appear to be sent by Christ till the contrary appears, until the contrary shows up. And I, I got news for you. True things can be preached by false people. <clears throat> We receive Christ himself when we receive his messengers. It wouldn't be right to say, uh, the apostle Paul saved me, or Billy Graham saved me, or Jimmy Swaggart saved me. Jesus saves us. He saves us. What a privilege it is to entertain Christ, to receive Christ through the ones who are sent in his name. To receive Christ is the way to receive God the Father, for they are one. Now, I want you to notice something here in verse 21 through 26. Um, I want you to notice that Jesus was troubled in his spirit 
Well, that's curious. Do you remember that Christ had proven his great love for Judas moments before washing his feet? He's cared for Judas and has not, to this point, singled him out. Love covers a multitude of sin. His heart, though, is broken that Judas could know him and not love him. Truly, Christ is familiar with rejection and its bitter pain. I think you know what it is like, too, to be dumped. <laughs> Have you ever, were you, when you were a young person, were you dumped by a boyfriend or a girlfriend, a potential uh, 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 sweetheart? Oh, most people have suffered that kind of thing. Do you remember the feelings? I'm such a nice guy. How could she not like me? <laughs> well, mm. You know, the rejection of Christ is a great grief to the Lord when people reject him. In fact, the sins of Christians are a great grief to Christ because in a sense, it's a rejection of him. So here he is troubled in his heart. And when Christ is troubled in his heart, his followers become troubled too. And the disciples are now brokenhearted over the idea that there's a betrayer in their midst. And they're not sure if it's them. In fact, most of them, I think, are probably saying, it's got to be me. It's got to be me. They're not angered that Jesus would say that. They, they're concerned. You know what this teaches me? That we disciples really don't know our own hearts as well as Christ does. That makes me feel good. He knows me better than I know myself. We often look to ourselves and then we look at each other with no clue as to who the traitor is among us. Christ perplexes them for a moment, and this is good. It causes them to examine themselves, to humble themselves, to take account of where they really stand. You know, a pause is good if we use it to examine ourselves and seek Christ. But when in doubt, seek Christ. Now, John was the one who was right next to him. He could ask Christ directly. And uh, so he did at the urging of the others. John quietly asked Jesus, hey, finger the traitor for me. Let me know who it is. He graciously asks this of Christ. And Christ knows the traitor. Though the others don't. I don't think they really suspected Judas because they made him the treasurer. That's a position of trust. Those nearest to Christ may approach him with the most delicate of matters, and so John does. It's wise to seek the prayers of those who have God's ear inclined toward them, don't you think? Hey, look, if I'm sick, I want to. I want to get somebody to pray for me that I think God will listen to. <laughs> and so Jesus indicates the traitor with a sign of love, that sop, a sign of love. Hmm. It's a sign of honor also. Judas, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to feed you. It's a sign of distinction. The sop of the master of the house was given in that culture to the one you sought to honor. And Christ loves and woos even those who hate him, even those who are traitors. Jesus, with that sop, is saying to Judas, I love you. Why don't you love me? But notice what happened in verse 27. You see it? Satan entered into him. Huh. Wow. Instead of being converted, Judas is confirmed in his wickedness and he's filled with more of it. Hey, I got news for you. The gospel's either going to do you good or do you bad. You're either going to turn or like, like Dave Walker has a shirt that says, uh, 
Um, Turn around or be left behind. <laughs> it's a good shirt. Turn around or be left behind. The devil is in every wicked man. However, sometimes he enters more powerfully than at other times. And such is the case here. The devil entered into him, it says. These betrayers of Christ have much of the devil in them. And the further they walk away from Christ, the further they walk in rebellion, the more the devil takes over. And then Christ dismisses Judas. And Judas willingly flees. <sighs> when Jesus looked into the eyes of Judas, after giving him that sop, and after dismissing him from that dinner, did he see hatred in Judas's eyes? Or did Judas avert his eyes and wouldn't look at Jesus? I don't know. You would think that Christ's gift would have made Judas better, but it didn't. Sometimes Christ's gifts make some men worse. And Judas goes quietly into the dark. There's nothing but darkness reserved for those who would flee from Christ, who is the light. How can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? The Bible asks. Well, the truth is, we can't. We can't. Those who turn their backs on the Lord and run from him are heading out into the night. They're heading out into the darkness and sin just tears people up, tears them up. For years, we worked among young people and it became clear to me, I would be in the neighborhoods that where there's a lot of wickedness and sin going on and the young people, the 16, 17, 18 year olds would be so strong and young and handsome and beautiful and you know they look so good they look so good but the 22 and 23 and 24 year olds look tore up by sin sin can tear you up and it can tear you up in quick order too it's sad when you see it, I know you've seen it before too, how people can just be destroyed by sin. But when you turn your back on Jesus and just walk away, what do you, what do you expect? That's what's gonna happen. That's what's gonna happen. So it's a heartbreak. But Jesus loves everybody. And he uh, even loves his enemies. He tells us to love our enemies. That's because he loves his enemies. And he's good to those who despitefully use him. And he was good even to Judas. Amazing, isn't it? Did you ever know that that sop was a sign of honor? Yeah. Sign of honor. What do we have? Anything like that? Oh, you can break the wishbone if you want to, you know. I guess. It's kind of a, that type of an honor. Well, Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for this story. It is a very sobering story that there are traitors, there are enemies that can even become a part of your inner circle. But Lord, it is encouraging to us to know that you love them and that you would even reach out to them. Oh, Father, help us to be faithful in all of our ways and in all of our doings. We want to walk in integrity of heart with you. We want to examine ourselves and Lord, line up with your word and your will and your way. Forgive us where we fail. And Lord, Lord, just help us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Help us to walk faithfully in your ways. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.